Hey, good morning, and welcome today to the Christian Church of Carl Junction. Uh, today's a little bit different. Uh, you may have noticed already we didn't have any singing on this particular worship time here. Uh, typically, we live stream things. However, today, uh, we are out serving at our big serve day all around the Carl Junction and Joplin areas. And we wanted to make sure, though, if you were traveling on the road or maybe you don't live local to where we are, that we still had a time to gather to hear the Word of God. And so today, I'm just going to be sharing a message. At the end, we'll have a time that we share uh, communion together uh, and uh, to offering a little bit. And then we're sent from this place to go and to serve God and to live out the mission of spreading His kingdom so people can come to Him, thrive in family, and go on mission also. Today uh, is our series called In the World. We're in the book of Daniel today. And in just a little bit, I'm going to get to Daniel chapter 6. Uh, is where I'm going to land at, Daniel chapter 6, and you'll be able to join me right there. But first, let me tell you a little bit of a story I heard. I heard this story one time about a tortoise and a scorpion. And this tortoise and this scorpion, they were on a journey together, and they met themselves right at the shore of a lake. And to continue the journey, this tortoise and this scorpion had to cross the lake together to get where they were going to go. And, and so the tortoise begins to plod slowly into the water to go where it was going to go. And the scorpion, though, recognized quickly he didn't know how to swim. And so he goes to the tortoise and says, may I please have a ride on your back? The tortoise looks at him and slowly says, as long as you don't sting me. The scorpion says, why would I sting you? If I sting you in the middle of the lake, then we both drown. Why would I possibly do that? And the tortoise says, well, that makes a lot of sense to me. And so he pauses at the edge of the water, and the scorpion climbs up on the back of the tortoise, and together they go out into the lake, the tortoise swimming slowly across the water, while the scorpion just rests and takes in the view of this ride across the lake. And everything's going great, and it's a beautiful day, and they, they get farther and farther and farther out into the water, and they get out so far into the water that it's difficult to look back and see the shore behind them, and they look to the sides, and all they see is water anywhere, and the, the next shore, their destination, is still far off on the horizon. And right in that moment, the scorpion stings the tortoise. And the tortoise yelps and says, why, why, did you, why did you sting me? We're both going to drown. And the scorpion says, as they were both sinking into the water, I stung you because it's my nature. It's what I do. You see, scorpions sting. It's what they do. And as much as he wanted to deny the fact that he would live up to his nature, he couldn't help himself. He did what he does. The sad truth of our broken world, our sin broken world is that broken people will attack other people simply because it's their nature see brokenness breeds more brokenness and people attack others with their words and with their actions with their gossip with with the things that they do and broken people attack broken people sabotage it's their nature it maybe in your brokenness, you've thought and had moments where you've realized that your nature is also to gossip, to be bitter, to attack other people. It's what they do. But by the grace of God, we get to have a new nature. A new thing comes into us, a new spirit, so we can live differently. But until we know Jesus, it's our nature to be broken. I hope you'll join with me today in asking God to speak out of his word to speak out of his word, to show us how to live disciplined lives in the midst of a sin-broken, undisciplined world. I'm just going to pray for just a moment, and then we're going to dive into Daniel chapter 6, verse number 1 together. Would you pray with me for a second? Father, I ask that today you would speak out of Daniel chapter 6. I ask, Father, that you would let us see your word read your word, hear your word, and I pray your spirit speak to us, showing us how we can live disciplined lives in the middle of a broken, undisciplined world so that we can somehow have a different end and we can live for you. And I pray, Father, you would make it very clear to us today, very obvious, how you would have us to live. I pray that in Jesus' name, amen. 
In Daniel chapter 6, we've been, the last few weeks in the book of Daniel, we've talked about how Daniel and his three friends came and they were taken into exile. They didn't see it coming. Bad things happened to otherwise good people and drug them into exile. But because they had an eternal perspective and they had a, a God-centered purpose, they were able to continue living well in there. We talked about the food that they were offered, the wine they were offered, the lifestyle they were given, the things they were called to in Babylon, and how they remained pure. They were committed to purity in their life. And next week, we're going, to talk about, we're going to talk about the fiery furnace and standing up against attacks in this world. But today, in Daniel 6, we're looking at a, a discipline in a broken world here. Daniel 6, verse 1, the middle of the story, it begins like this. It pleased Darius. Darius was the king at the time. It pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the, country, the kingdom now, the satraps were rulers that would help them, like maybe think of governors along the way. They had three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. See, Daniel, who started off as a lowly exile, one drug into a broken world, bad things happened to him because of who he was and who his identity and his commitment to a godly purpose with an eternal perspective, he was able to raise himself to a point of authority and responsibility. He was an administrator. The satraps here, it says Daniel 6, they were made accountable to them so the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among all the other administrators and all the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set Daniel over the whole kingdom. He was going to be in charge of everything as far as he could see. At this, the administrators and the satraps, they tried to find some grounds to charge Daniel and his conduct to government affairs, but they were unable to do so. Remember, 1 Peter chapter 2, we read a few weeks ago, live such good lives among the pagans, the broken, that though they try to accuse you, they can find nothing wrong. This is what's happening to Daniel. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. And finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man unless it has something to do with the law of his God. See, they found in Daniel that he was so committed to God that they knew if they were going to be able to trap, to, to attack Daniel in some way, it was going to have to do with his commitment to his kingdom, to his king. See, culture around us, the, the sin-broken culture around us, they are not offended by our faith, really, as much as they are by our position but our faith becomes a target of opportunity for their ambition. And so they began to attack Daniel in this way. This is the reason why the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write that we should be people above reproach. We should have integrity, be trustworthy, be respectable. That's why Paul wrote that wanting to be a leader in the church is a noble task because you're standing up in a broken world saying this is who I'm going to be and you're putting yourself out there as a target for people whose nature it is to attack others a world that lives for itself and chases every temptation and every whim that satan puts in front of it will always attack the people around them it's the nature of sin but the kingdom of god is marked by integrity honor trustworthiness it's our new nature it's who we are back to daniel chapter six if i can jump back in it says so these administrators and the satraps they went as a group to the king and they said to the king may king darius live forever the royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or any human being during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty, King Darius, shall be thrown in the lion's den. Now, your majesty, issue the decree, put it in writing so it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. And so King Darius then put the decree in writing. Now, when Daniel learned that this decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. And three times a day, he got down on his knees and he prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. Do you see what Daniel does? His response might come a little unexpectedly. It might be a bit surprising to you. 
when he learned that these, these sad traps, these administrators, these governors, these leaders, they were attacking him on the basis of his faith and his commitment to his God, he did not complain. He didn't rally people to his cause. It might have been easy for Daniel to walk out in the street and say, fellow Jews who live here in Babylon with me, rise up. We need to sign a petition and take it to the king and do these things. He didn't do that. That's nothing that he did. Instead, Daniel simply went home. He opened his window to Jerusalem. He got on his knees. And he continued to pray. What was his prayer? It doesn't really tell us exactly what his prayer was here. But I think that his prayer was probably similar to what it had been before. And I'm guessing from the character of Daniel, that before his prayer might have been on behalf of the broken people in the sin-broken culture that was all around him. I'm wondering if his prayer might have been things like, oh God, I pray you'd bless these people, that you would save these people from their sin, that you would open their eyes to the blindness of their culture, that you would call them to you. I think Daniel prayed for the people that were around him. And when he learned that those very people were trying to attack him, his response was to keep praying to continue on. He didn't go looking for deliverance in some other kind of a way. You see, it would have been tempting for him, maybe, maybe some of you, maybe you today, right now, you are facing a situation, a thing at work or at home or your neighborhood, your school, you're facing a situation right now and you're saying, I don't know what I'll do with this. And instead of praying for the people who are attacking you and praying for the culture that is broken all around you, instead, you are asking God, deliver me from this problem right now. See, some of us are looking for deliverance when we actually need to be pursuing a discipline of praying, a discipline of loving, a discipline of serving. We need to stop looking for deliverance and start pursuing discipline. There are times we do need to be delivered out of the storm by the Lord, but there are more times, I would say, that we need to embrace discipline before the storm. Let me tell you a story. I, one time, many, many years ago, I went on a camping trip. I, I had a young man that was growing up in my church, and he was in the student ministry I was leading, and, and, and this young man's father had, had tragically passed away. And he wanted to go to a camp, a church camp event, a camp, a type of camp where it was a father-son event, and he had to have someone go with him, and he came, and, and he asked me, Adam, would you go with me? And I was incredibly honored to step in in place of his father to go on this camping trip with him. And I don't know if you know me, but I, I love the outdoors, but I, I, I'm not always much of an outdoorsman, if that makes sense. I, I get myself into bad situations sometimes, and this was one of those situations. We went on a, a several day long camping trip where one day we went spelunking through the caves and, and we wore these helmets and these lights and we crawled through dark holes full of mud and all kinds of things and, and explored in some new places. And one day we went hiking along these ravines and these little ledges that looked over these, these hundreds of feet far down falls. And one day we went white water rafting. I don't know if you've been whitewater rafting before, but this was my first experience, and it was a blast. We got to the place where we were going to go whitewater rafting here, and we got prepared. We, we had the, the, the life vests and the helmets and, and all these things. We gathered up together, and the instructor, the guide, came, and he said, I need to tell you a few things so we can all make it through our whitewater rafting experience, and we can all enjoy it at the end because we're not hurt. Let me tell you a few things. And he begins to explain how the paddles work and how the helmets work, how the life vests are for. He begins to explain how to handle ourselves when we get into rapids. He tells us what to do if we fall out of the raft and how to get out of things. And, and I decided right then I was not going to fall out of the raft. But he told us how to not do that or what to do if we did. And then he told us the way to not fall out of the raft. And the way you don't fall out of the raft is there were little hooks for our feet in the raft. And you take your foot and you hook your foot right under this little hook and you, you hang on for dear life by your literal toes. They're hooked up under here. Well, we begin to go down the river and it's nice and calm and there's no rapids to be seen because we were just in the floating part of the trip. We're floating along right here and this seems pretty easy. We turned the bend, and there were some, some little rapids just right in front of us. I look at Matt, who's right next to me here, and we smile and say, here we go. And 
we both hook our feet in, and now because I had committed myself, I will not come out of this raft. I had hooked on, and I had my little toes locked in place, and I was holding on for dear life. I had foot cramps, but I didn't care because I wasn't going to fall out. I went through the, raft, the rapids right in that spot, and I realized this was no big deal. A piece of cake. A piece of cake. I didn't even get jostled around. We just kind of slid through the rapids, and it was no big deal. And we came around a bend. There were more rapids. The same thing happened time after time after time after time. And you know what happens when you go through rapids time after time after time after time? And you get complacent, you get lazy, and my feet started hooking a little less solidly around the foot pegs, and, and then we come around this bend, and there were some rapids, and the two rapids kind of came together, and they twisted around the curve here, and these rapids looked awesome, and we go toward the middle, we're going to go through this whole thing, and as I went through, I had one foot kind of lazily hooked under this thing, the other foot was kind of kicked out over the other one, and, and we're there, and I'm hanging on, and we hit the rapid, and as soon as we hit the rapid, the whole raft went up in the air as it bounced, and the raft went back down into the rapid but I went that way and I flew out of this raft I'm sure I made the most manly sound you've ever heard as I was flying through the air I landed in the water and I hit the bottom and hit the rocks and I was glad I had a helmet on and I banged around a little bit and I floated on in the river and in my shame I was hauled back up into the raft again and I realized it was important to stay disciplined even if I felt like I was strong enough to not need to be disciplined. See, when, when we're going through life with a sin-broken culture all around us, it's easy to get complacent. I mean, sure, we talk in church and we talk in worship times. We talk about how the world's broken and and people, it's their sinful nature to attack others, to sting other people, to betray them, to sabotage things, and, and to let relationships be hurtful instead of helpful. We talk about that all, but truthfully, truthfully, I live here in in America where life's pretty easy, and most of us, you probably do as well. We live in a place where life's pretty easy. It's no big deal to go to church. It's no big deal to go to work. It's an easy way to live, and it's easy to get complacent and to forget the discipline that comes before we need deliverance. You see, the truth is, in that whitewater rafting incident, if I had remained disciplined, I probably would not have needed delivered from the rapids, from the water. But because my discipline slipped, I needed to be delivered. See, we know what happens next to Daniel. If you've read Daniel 6 before, you know what happens next. You know that he's going to end up in a lion's den, that God's going to shut the mouths of the lions, and we'll read that in a second. You know what's coming, though, but Daniel didn't know that. Daniel had no idea. Daniel just knew that he was in a sin-broken culture, and he had lived a disciplined life, praying and praying and praying for the people that were all around him. And now when he's under attack, he knew that if he was going to be delivered from this moment, he had to remain disciplined through the middle of the storm. And so Daniel prayed. That was the way he fought his battles. He prayed. He knelt down and he prayed. Question for you, will living more disciplined Will being more disciplined about praying, will that keep you and me from suffering through hard times? No. Will being more disciplined about reading the Word of God keep us from going through difficulties? Probably not. Will being more disciplined about gathering with the rest of the church, whether we're online or we're in person, will that keep us from experiencing pain? Probably not. Probably not. But they'll set us up. So the moment comes when we are in pain and we are in hurt and we are in trouble. In that moment, it is natural for us to reach for our Savior because we're disciplined. Our feet are locked in on the foundation that he gives us. See, we all want to be delivered from the hard things, but we don't want the discipline that sets up the deliverance. Today, I want you to know that your discipline right now Your discipline right here, no matter how easy your life might feel today, your discipline right now prepares you for the deliverance 
that is to come. Let me continue reading in Daniel 6 with you. It says, then these men went as a group. They would gotten the law sign. So they went as a group and they found Daniel praying and asking God for help. And so then they went to the king and they spoke to the king about his royal decrees. He said, did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any God or human being except you, your majesty, King Darius, will be thrown into the lion's den? And the king answered, well, the decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, it cannot be repealed. And then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, he pays no attention to you, your majesty, or to the decree you put into writing. He still prays three times a day. And when the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. But, but the next words tell us the king wasn't distressed because of his anger, his jealousy, or his pride. He was greatly distressed because he loved Daniel. He was determined to rescue Daniel. He made every effort until sundown to save him. The king wanted to rescue Daniel. There was obviously a relationship between the two, and I think it became a relationship, a bond between them because Daniel was so disciplined in praying for the king. See, when we're consistently present, consistently intentional around people, even non-believers, bonds are built and seeds are planted. Relationships have the potential to bear fruit. You see, the men, these ones, the, the satraps and the administrators, the governors, they went as a group to King Darius. They said, remember, remember your majesty, King Darius, that according to the law, the Medes and Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. And so the king, sure enough, he gave the order. It's in Daniel 6. He gave the order, and they brought Daniel, and they threw him into the lion's den. This horrific, terrifying place down in the darkness and the danger and the storm. And the king called out to Daniel, may your God, whom you continually serve, rescue you. Do you catch the cry of hope from the king of a broken nation? It's not quite a prayer, but it's a cry of hope. Do you know how significant this is? Because of Daniel's discipline and his commitment and his perseverance and his perspective and his purpose and the way that he's living right here, the purity of his life, because of all these things all coming together, you have a pagan, broken king whose very nature it is to sting other people and to raise himself up as the one who lords over everybody. This king in this moment says, may your God rescue you. A cry of hope. It says in Daniel 6 that a stone was brought and was placed over the mouth of the den and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace. He spent the night without eating, without any entertainment being brought to him. He could not sleep. He was so distraught over this whole thing. At the first light of dawn, the king got up. He hurried to the lion's den. When he came near to the den, he called Daniel in an anguished voice. Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you continually serve, been able to rescue you from the lions? See, when we consistently, persistently, with discipline, lock our feet into the foundation of Jesus Christ and invest in the relationship with the people around us, what we find is that when troubled times come, the people that are around us almost hold their breath and wait to find out and see, will your God do what you say you believe he can do? Will you give up your faith or will you stay on course? Is this the end for you or is it just a turn in the road? They wait to see. Of course, we know Daniel answered the king, may the king live forever. My God sent his angel, he shut the mouths of the lions. They've not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done anything wrong before you, your majesty. See, Daniel was delivered, but the deliverance began in his discipline. And we tend to skip over that part to get to this one, don't we? When I learned the story as a child, we skipped over all that to get to the part. God closed the mouths of the lion because God is a good God who rescues his people but you see Daniel's prayers, it was all part one. It was the setup for what happens right now. 
You can't ignore the discipline. You can't skip over the discipline. You can't overlook the discipline. You can't downplay the discipline. It's right here. The king in Daniel 6 was overjoyed. He gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. His discipline set up his deliverance. And then the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and they were thrown into the lion's den along with their wives and their children. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. And then King Darius wrote to all the nations and peoples of every language in all the earth, may you prosper greatly. I issued a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. See, when we live lives of discipline, then our God doesn't just bring deliverance to us. He brings deliverance through us for the people around us. You are surrounded by people who are broken. It's their nature to attack. It's their nature to sting. It's their nature to do things that are mean and hateful. So don't be surprised when they live into their nature. But if you are a follower of Jesus, if you're a follower of Jesus, then you have a new nature, and your nature is to be disciplined. And when you're attacked, you pray. And when someone, when someone sabotages you, you pray. And someone tries to betray you, you read the word of God and you pray. And when they come against you, you embrace them and you pray for them. Because you have a new nature given by a Holy Spirit. So you can become like the image of God. This is what you are. I want to invite you today, if you've not followed Jesus, I want to invite you to follow him right now today. I want to invite you to take steps of following him, to step into a family where you receive a new nature and you get to live a different kind of a life where you can live a disciplined life so that when the next storm comes, your feet are locked in on the foundation of Jesus Christ and you are ready for whatever the rapids bring to you. I want to invite you to follow Jesus. We follow him in the way we read in the book of Acts. We change the way we think. We repent, the Bible word. We're lowered into water, forgiven of our sins. We'll come out with the Holy Spirit of God with a new nature and a new way and a new discipline. I want to invite you, if you've not followed Jesus, or maybe you did, but you've wandered away from him, I want to invite you to come back to him today. And just right now, you can, you can take a step right now, a next step. You can send us a message, a private message, or comment publicly right here either way, and let us know, let me know what you're thinking and the step you're taking back toward Jesus today so we can come alongside you and have conversations, and we can coach you, and we can pray for you and be disciplined with you, and we can help you return to the life you were made for with the new nature that God wants to give you today. And for all of us that already follow, if you already follow Jesus, then today I am inviting, I'm challenging, I'm calling calling you to live through the storms of life with your feet locked in on the foundation that is Jesus Christ so you can be firm on the foundation he gives you. I'm going to pray for us. After I pray, we're going to spend just a couple of moments in a time of communion together. But right now, as I pray, I would love for you just to take a posture of prayer. Maybe close your eyes, just focus your mind, your heart on who God is. Open your hands up to receive whatever he's saying and just listen right now for God to speak back as we go to him together. Let me pray for you. Father, I ask, I ask that you would rescue us, that you would deliver us. If we don't know you, if someone here doesn't know you right now, I pray you would deliver us so we can come to know you and can grow in our discipline. And for all of us that do know you, I pray we'd be growing in discipline right now. And as we are, that our natural reaction is to grab a hold of you whenever troubled times and the storms come. I pray, Father, that you would show us the beauty of your word, the goodness of your kingdom, and the purpose you made us for. And I pray we would live lives that are disciplined, no matter what the sin-broken world throws at us. 
I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We are going to pause for just a second, and we're going to take communion together. I want to invite you, if you've not done this already, maybe you have a habit of this already, but if you haven't, go ahead and grab something right now that you can eat, that you can drink, to remember the body and the blood of Jesus. As you do that, let me remind all of us of the story that we believe God made everybody in his image. You and me, we are made in the image of God. Maybe not our fingers and toes, but our heart and our mind. We are made in our spirit in the image of God. And he made us all to live in a world that was without sin. It wasn't broken. But we have an enemy who comes along and he, he whispers and he tempts and he twists and he distorts. And because of that, because of that, we now know what true brokenness feels like. That our God, who is so good, and our Father, who loves us so much, he couldn't bear to leave us in our brokenness, so he sent his Son, Jesus, from heaven to earth to die on a cross, he buried in a tomb, and to resurrect again, so that we, you and I, might have a chance at a new nature. And right now, we remember that we pause every time we gather to remember the body that was broken on the cross, and the blood that was shed for the forgiveness of our sins, knowing that it is in that act that we gain the opportunity to be made new again. Nothing you do can earn your way, work your way, or buy your way out of brokenness. If you surrender to Jesus, he will give you a new nature. Right now, I would like for you just to take the thing you have, the, the item you have to eat. Go ahead and eat that together, remembering the body of Jesus was broken on the cross for us. And I'd love for you to take the, the juice or the Coca-Cola or the water, whatever it is you have, and drink that together to remember the blood of Jesus that was shed for the forgiveness of your sins and my sins and the whole world's sins. And God, I thank you for that gift. I thank you for this new nature. I thank you for your great love. And I pray we would never forget what made it all possible. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. At our church also, we take an offering up every time that we gather together. And that offering goes toward the mission of the kingdom of God, helping us to come to Jesus, thrive in family, and go on mission. And it's so that other people can come to Jesus and thrive in family also. And I want to encourage you to continue giving toward that mission. If you've never given, this is a great time to start. And if you've been giving, it's a great time to continue giving toward that mission, knowing you are playing a role in helping somebody step out of a sin-broken world and into a kingdom that gives them hope and gives them life. There are easy ways to give here at the church. You can give online at our website at cccj.church. There's a giving tab there. I personally give that way every week. Uh, you can also give in our app. It's called You Are Sent. It's free on all mobile devices, and you can give right there uh, through an easy, safe, and secure portal as well. Uh, or you can mail your gift in to 103 Hodge Drive here in Carl Junction, Missouri. That's our church office. But however you give, make sure that you are returning the things you are managing back to the kingdom of God so that we can go on mission and see more people come to Jesus, thrive in family, and go on mission also. Here at our church, we never dismiss because we believe the kingdom of God and his mission goes on and on and on, and we want to continue to be a part of that, living intentionally and disciplined in pursuit of his kingdom mission. And so here at this church, we always send on that mission. And so, church, until I see you again, you are sent. Have a great day.